So thank you all for coming. And today we'll cover, uh, we'll basically analyze an SSL VPN appliance. We'll show its internal implementation, services exposed, and pr pretty much how to own it. So a little bit about myself. Uh, everybody told me to do a small bio. So most of what I do is reverse engineering, a lot of embedded systems. I do a lot of development as well, and I found I also have really enjoyed doing uh, zero-day research. I found a few vulnerabilities in Flash, PCNware, EMC Networker, Windows Briefcase, and others that are not public yet. I have no formal education. I basically I got a computer when I was 12, and I dropped out of school when I was 13. So, <laughs> yeah. So a little bit about the research itself. It basically started when a friend of mine called me and said, I'm doing a penetration test, and I really need to own this company. But they don't have anything ex exported. The only thing public is the SSL VPN login. So we started doing some research about this SSL VPN itself. And as it turns out, it had an old vulnerability actually found by a SEC consult, which basically allowed you to read arbitrary files from the SSL VPN itself. But we weren't able to actually exploit it. We weren't sure if the, the company itself was patched or, or we might have been exploiting it incorrectly. So I, I started reading about the appliance itself, and I noticed that it has a virtual edition. The virtual edition is basically a virtual box image that you download, and you can run the appliance yourself and test it for like a trial. So that should be a better solution. Oh, sorry. So a little bit about virtual private networks, or as I like to call them, private networks. This is a common network diagram that has uh, an SSL VPN appliance. As you can see, the appliance is behind a firewall, and it's, it's basically exposed through the net. A, a user, user log in to the SSL VPN, and then he gets access to the LAN servers or whatever is configured. On common the common situation is that you have an any any rule from the SSL VPN appliance onto the LAN servers. And when that happens, you can attack any service inside the LAN once you get access to the SSL VPN appliance itself. So this is what we'll try to do to get really command execution on the appliance itself. So a small note. F5 stated that this SSL VPN appliance is deprecated. They have a new, a new appliance that is a different architecture. Everything is different. And this one is supported only for legacy purposes. So it, maybe it's not that valuable. So I did a little bit of digging. And I took, I can't name any of the companies that actually use it, but I took the net worth of three companies and combined it together, and it's $177 billion, so three companies. So it's still pretty valuable. And there are about um, over 100 that I found just Googling quickly. So we're actually going to analyze the virtual edition and not the physical appliance, since we can just download it. So a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of analyzing a virtual, a virtual box, a virtual image. The virtual machine actually runs on your instruction set. It runs on, yeah, great. Runs on x86 or x64. Because basically, you can run it on other, you can emulate other architectures as well, but it's not, it's not cost effective. And you can also, for example, in virtual in VMware, you can connect to the machine and can debug it during runtime. So it should be pretty easy to analyze things on a virtual appliance and not a physical one. In addition, you also have the factor of software encryption, which, which I mean, on physical appliances, you may have dedicated hardware being used to encrypt the hard drive, for example. On virtual ones, you can't have that because you can't send, a, send me any, any dedicated hardware with my download. 
So it should be a lot easier to analyze. But there are also a couple of disadvantages as well. Because since this may be a different architecture, for example, the physical appliance might run PowerPC, while the virtual one runs whatever your computer runs, which is x86 or 64. So you might have an integer overflow on x86, but that, that same problem might not occur on PowerPC because it's a different tool chain. It compiles onto a different, to a different binary. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same. And you might have some different internal implementations. For example, a physical appliance might require um, drivers that the virtual one doesn't. It might have different interfaces and basically a few slight differences within the implementation itself. You also may have some maintenance issues where the physical appliance is patched while the virtual one isn't. So it could be a bit more difficult to match the, whole, the exact vulnerabilities. And we can't develop any memory corruption exploits. I mean, we can, we could probably, but since it's a different architecture and we don't really know the memory layout, we can't test it. We can only get a memory corruption vulnerability to work on the virtual edition. Or it might be possible with a lot of reverse engineering to figure out how exactly it would behave on the different instruction set, but it won't be easy. So I started out by just downloading the vulnerable version. Like we said, there was, there was a, an old vulnerability that allowed you to read files from the appliance itself. So I wanted to see if I can exploit it. I downloaded it. All right, so I got the download, and it boots correctly. But apparently, you can't activate it. So as it, as it turns out, F5 disabled activation. I actually talked to them on the phone for over an hour. They wouldn't activate it no matter what. So there's no way of using the vulnerable one. So the only thing that we can do is try to find new vulnerabilities, zero days. So that sounds, sounds about right. Let's try that. I began by mapping the actual attack surface from a black box pers perspective. Um, the only open ports were the HTTP, HTTPS, and SSH. The SSH is a bit weird as well, because I tried connecting to it, and it failed due to some weird error. Uh, we'll go over it a bit later. And apparently, most of the services exposed are HTTP-based. Since this is an SSL VPN, everything is exported over HTTP or HTTPS. And everything is also seems to be implemented on PHP, in PHP. So this will be our main attack vector for now. But there is no point in analyzing everything from a black box perspective, because we do have the physical, the, not the physical, the virtual appliance on our machine. And we should be able to extract the PHP files, examine configurations, see if there's anything else we're missing, some different attack vectors. So we should probably try to extract everything from it. Like, like I said before, virtual machines can be kernel debugged. So basically, when you, like on VMware, for example, when you enable a feature called debug stub, you get VMware to bind on port 8832, and it basically waits for GDB to connect. So you connect to it, and then you can patch bytes and read bytes and basically get a shell. So I started playing with it a little bit, and I was actually able to do a lot of things, but I don't even know the kernel version. So it's going to take me a bit longer than I would like to spend to actually get a shell. And there's a few, there, there's another way that we should be able to do it a bit more easily. So I mounted the actual uh, virtual machines drive onto a different operating system. So I began examining what the hard drive actually contained. So it contained a small boot partition, about 67 megabytes. And the rest of the hard drive was completely encrypted. So the only thing that you can see is the 67 megabyte partition. It contained a few interesting files. It contained 
the encryption key for the rest of the hard drive, the root key dot gpg. It contained lo setup, and it contained gpg. The thing that the, you usually do with these three is to basically mount the encrypted drive, the encrypted hard drive, as a loopback device uh, through GPG using LO setup. That way, you have a const um, encryption decryption gateway, so you can access the drive as if it's not encrypted. I tried to actually do that and mount the encrypted drives, and it, so for some reason, it asked me for a password. I'm not sure. It might be. It might have been my mistake, but. It asked me for a password, and I don't know the password. So here's the actual boot partition. These are th the, th the three scripts. And you also have the, ker the kernel version here, so we should be able to go back if we fail. So I decided to actually do it a bit differently and interact with the, with the boot system, with the boot process. I replaced the LO setup uh, binary executable with an executable that I wrote that launches a BZBox shell. So basically, what I did here was to break the decryption process the way, a way that the next time that the, the system would boot, once it would try to decrypt the hard drive, it would launch a BZBox shell instead. And so it did. And I didn't really re remove the LO setup. I just renamed it to underscore LO setup. So I would still be able to do the actual decryption at the same environment as it was originally supposed to happen. And this is the shell that I got when I, when I just replaced it with a BusyBox shell. So during a normal boot process, you have a lot of text flying around. And I noticed that one of them was the actual decryption command, as you can see. So once, once I was at the BusyBox shell, I tried to run the exact same command. And it actually worked. It decrypted the file system, and I was able to access any file that I wanted. So at this point, I just uh, statically compiled a backdoor that just gives me a shell, the most trivial shell. I added the execution to initrd, and I, I rebooted, and I got a debug shell. So now I should be able to extract PHP scripts, check the environment out, and do whatever I want to actually understand how everything work, works with this appliance. So I started mapping everything from a white box perspective. Now this is interesting, because apparently the distribution is Slackware 7.1. That's from June 22, 2000. That's <laughs> When I, started, when I started playing with Linux, it was Slackware 8. And I was about 14 or 13, I think. So that's pretty old. OpenSSL, what about that? 0.9.7D, March 17, 2004. <laughs> and finally, Apache, 1.3.33, October 29, 2004. So as you can see, the whole environment is very, 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 very old. And, and everything is old. It's not just these. So these, these applications are vulnerable. For every one of them has about four vulnerabilities that are completely stable and can be exploited relatively easy. And we're running on Slackware 7.1. So there's no one has ever thought of ASLR back then, or DEP, or I think that there's no nothing to protect any memory corruptions. But there's still a, it's still very hard to exploit a vulnerability for an architecture that you don't even know. You don't know the target architecture, because you don't know if it's PowerPC or anything else. So maybe it's x64 or x86. So we could, we could order an appliance off eBay and wait a couple of months for it to arrive, but I want to. On it, on it right now. There's no time for the actual delivery. So we'll continue mapping everything out. I continued mapping things, and I found out that there were, there were a few unknown Apache models. That sounds interesting. Like we said before, the SSH was a bit weird because it wouldn't allow us to connect. So as it turns out, the SSH is modified. It's not your normal SSHD. 
you have a PSOX reveal that you have a binary called F5 SSHD. So <laughs> I immediately launched this assembler and I checked it out and it basically wraps around SSHD. And the reason that it failed the initial connection was because it expected you to send it something. And if you send it the keyword F5 access, it sends you back an encrypted blob titled F5 support ticket. So after the whole project was done, I actually talked with F5 and I asked them about it. And they said that it's basically a support ticket. And F5 can connect remotely to any box because they have the decryption keys. So I'm guessing that it's a pretty interesting <laughs> place to continue research. But I dropped it, and I continued analyzing everything. Since we can download the PHP scripts now, there's no point in digging too deep into that. So I downloaded the PHP scripts. I opened one of the scripts, and this is what I got. MZ. <laughs> the whole thing is some sort of a binary. But it's not a binary. It's not a PE. I tried disassembling it. It does, didn't make any sense. So I started thinking, what can this be? It's, it looks maybe compressed or encrypted. I don't know. So I decided to check the entropy of the file, the character distribution. So in this graph, you have the green lines represent Basically, you have 0 up until 255, which is the ASCII code, and 0 up until 8, which is the percentage of the file composed by that ASCII code. So as you can see, in the green line, you have a normal PHP script that basically wherever you have a common character, you see a spike. And the blue line is flat. So what this means is that the file is either compressed or encrypted because the, f the character distribution is flat. So I actually did a small run with binwalk over it, and I couldn't find any compression headers. So apparently, the file is well, probably encrypted. So I started digging about PHP encryption and obfuscation. As it turns out that there are two types of encryption and obfuscation on PHP. You have the one that is basically on the text level, where you have the actual, you have a, an encrypted blob, and PHP does an eval of decrypt of that, that blob. And you have at the extension level, where you have a PHP extension that basically, once you run a PHP script, once you ask it to compile a PHP script for it, it basically compiles it, it takes the bytecode, it encrypts it, and then it saves that in a script. So you basically have an encrypted um, PHP bytecode, not PHP text, PHP bytecode. So I found one of these appliances, on the, one of these um, uh, encryption models on the appliance, uh, and a, a model called IonCube. Some of you may have heard of it. I personally have never seen that before. And I also found a talk by Stefan Esser that explained that th these solutions exist. And you can probably, you sh there's a tool, there's a technique that you can bypass them and actually extract the PHP bytecode. And basically, it's some sort of a PHP reverse engineering process. So as we said, this solution precompiles and encrypts the PHP code. But there is a solution. The solution is called xdebug. It's basically a PHP extension that you use to um, the xdebug has a subcomponent called the VLD. I think it's Vone, some logical dump, something. Don't remember it exactly. And he basically hooks all of the uh, bytecode handlers, and and whoever gets called, it basically dumps the representation of what it did in some sort of a. You can see the flow of everything that worked. Since this is an old, I'm guessing that some of the newer version of IonCube might have added some more protections, but this version is old, like the whole environment, so it should probably work. So, but it's going to be very hard to work with something that you need to get a binary for Slackware 7.1 because you don't have the compiler available. And the one that you do have available 
is so old that it doesn't compile the code, and you have this very annoying dependency, dependency chain that you need to solve. So if everything will fail, I'll go back to that one, but I'll continue examining the whole environment before. I'll dig into that one. I also enabled the MySQL log. So this is, this is pretty useful, because you can see every query as it gets executed. You just, you, you just do a tail minus f on the SQL log, and you can see the queries like this, for example, is part of the process of logging in with, a valid, with, with an invalid username, actually. So we should be able to detect things like SQL injections relatively easy. I also continued um, setting up the whole instructions, the whole uh, environment. I, tried, I uh, tried to install tools. It wasn't easy. It took a while, but, I, but we managed to install GCC, SSH, and a lot of other things. Up until now, we were using a, dis a disgusting reverse shell that didn't get the, uh, that, uh, the STD error quite well, and it was very annoying. So I decided to, to take another look at the rest of the unknown Apache models. And as it turns out, there's one interesting one, there's an especially interesting one, the tunnel handler. As you can see, it gets exported into a virtual directory, which means that every request that you send to slash tunnel gets handled by tunnel handler. At this point, we don't know who actually handles it, which one of the Apache models, because an Apache model, once it, lo it, lo it gets loaded, it says, I want to register this handler and that handler and that handler. And that way, you don't really know exactly at this point who handles it. So I immediately launched the uh, browser and tried to access the slash tunnel directory. And I got the error invalid parameters. Makes sense, I didn't send any parameters. And I grabbed the Apache models for that same error. And I found it. And I found the binary that actually creates that error. And I figured out the missing parameters. And this is the, ex the actual error that you get. So I started playing with the parameters while having the log enabled. And I found an SQL injection vulnerability. So that should be pretty easy, right? The MySQL runs as root. You have privileges to write. You have an every privilege available in MySQL. So just do a union select into alt file and finish everything up, right? So this is the actual query, the vulnerable parameters as well. And this is the SQL log. Once we request hello single quote and the session parameter, we get hello single quote, nothing's filtered. So usually when you when you when you when you will want to exploit a vulnerability using a write into out file, you'll do something similar to this, where the black text is the const query and the red ones are user input. So basically what you do here is you, you append hello and terminate the query, and you do a union select of const data into an out file. This is just for a test, but usually you'd, you would want to you would wanna write it into a PHP script. That way, whenever the PHP scripts get, ex get requested, the code get, gets executed. The data and x gets written into that file, the const values. And by the way, the line below is how we progress as we propagate the query and get, understand things. So when I sent the query AAA space. I got AAA percent 20. As it turns out, Apache model doesn't decode URL encoded strings. So it's a bit annoying because we can't use any spaces. But, and I also, I continued trying a lot of different encodings because I really wanted to be able to use spaces and stuff. So I sent AAA space AAA and I got AAA Space, 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 0x, 1.d, 42, so on, as the actual query. So apparently, there is a format string vulnerability on that same argument. And I actually found out that this assembly confirmed 
it's a format sling vulnerability. And here is another test. You can see a small stack trace. So this is nice and all, but we have a logical vulnerability. There is no point in exploiting memory corruption. And as we said before, we already have, like, I don't know how many vulnerable applications have every application every application on this appliance is vulnerable. So there's no point in digging into that. So we should try to, con to actually exploit the SQL injection. And as it turns out, we can't use any spaces. So how can we, how can we actually write a, qu a valid query? And it's pretty easy. Um, you can use block comments instead of spaces. It's an old technique used for web application firewall bypasses for like eight years ago. But we still need to be able to ignore the rest of the query, because we, 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 we want to write into our file, and we don't want the rest of the query to destroy, destroy our query. So you have, the thing that you would usually do is a minus minus and a space, which basically terminates the rest of the query. So we continue updating our query. We added uh, comments instead of spaces, and minus minus, and a space, and no space at the time. So the documentation itself actually confirmed that you have to have a space. A tab won't work, a comment won't, won't work, nothing would. But we already have a format string vulnerability. From a format, from a format string actually works the way that you have percent being the format specifier. Then you have an option of padding character to pad the, the output width if it doesn't reach the character width, which is the 20 in this example. And then you have the actual format, which is, for example, a, dec a decimal digit. So if I'm writing a percent 20 D, I will have space, 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 and the number that actually exists at the stack at the moment. So this should work as a valid terminator because we can always use percent %100D, and there's no number that gets printed to 100, at least not on 32 or 64-bit systems. So this actually works as a valid terminator. Just doing a minus minus percent %20D will have minus minus space, 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 and the rest of the query that gets ignored because it's already commented. So I actually composed the union select into out file, with the valid terminator and everything, but it failed. But everything seems to be fine. Everything looks all right. So I connected to the box using SSH, and I tried running the query myself, and it still failed, which is a bit strange. Then I tried modifying a few things, and it failed. And I tried the most trivial union select query from the MySQL documentation, and it failed as well. So as it turns out, remember how we said everything is so old? The MySQL version is 3.23. And <laughs> so a little bit about MySQL 3.23. No union selects, no nested queries. <laughs> we can't do a join because we're at the while condition, but that's unrelated. But basically, all of your previous SQL injection exploitation techniques will fail because it's too old for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we can write the, the results of the existing query into, our, into an out file. So it's nice. We should probably examine the actual table to see if we can use it to do something else. But right now, we can't control it. So basically, what we do in order to actually write the existing query into an out file, we replace the there's an original compare, 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 I forget, comparing Kitsa. <laughs> and remove it, uh, modify it with or one equal one so that it will always work, and then write that into an out file. So that way you have the whole content of the query of the table written into out file whenever. The table itself. The table itself is TBL log sessions. It basically contain, contains a log of all sessions that, that were ever made. It's not just the active ones. 
So it could be pretty useful because it does contain the active ones. So you should be able to just dump it into an out file, into the basically into the web service directory, and just request it. And you can use other people's sessions. That's nice, but it's not that good. If we could, however, update update it and add uh, PHP code into it, and then write it into a PHP file. We, we would be able to execute our own code. But it only gets updated once you log in successfully. So it's not that good. So this was my personal breakpoint. I, I spent like two days just reading the documentation, reading the source code, trying to find a logical vulnerability, somehow exploiting this vulnerability. This vulnerability. And then I found an interesting post on Stack Overflow you have you, you have field terminators apparently some some guy wanted to export his data into a csv file so as you can see here you have field terminated by arbitrary data so maybe i can place my own php code in there so this i updated the query to contain a small php code evaluation with the field separated by and I got code execution. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty interesting. That's so this is nice. There's a minor downside. Because you have field, field separators, or field terminators, or line terminators, you have to have lines or fields. So you have to have some content within that table. But as we said before, the table logs all sessions. It's not just the current active ones. So if an admin has ever logged in to the server just to configure it, to change the default password two years ago, it would still work. And if it didn't, you can use the default password. So, <laughs> so it's a win-win. It doesn't matter. But I'm guessing it's not much to ask in a production environment. So we got root. Pretty nice. But what can we do other than that? How can we continue? As we said, we might, be dis we, want, we might have some difficulties advanced onto the network because of the firewall. So we can start by just installing a rootkit. I assume it shouldn't be a problem on Slackware 7.1, unless it's just too old for mo modern rootkits. And you can just sniff the traffic. You're after the SSL encryption, so everything that is not encrypted within the network, you can just encrypt, just sniff right away. You have TCP dump available on the box for diagnostics, so you can use it for whatever you want. You could also manage the middle VPN clients. Suppose that someone wants to connect to an internal uh, RDP server, you can just grab that packet, send it onto the net, uh, do whatever you want, sniff it. Uh, modify things, turn it into a hostile uh, server. We can also extract certificates. Apparently, some companies actually use wildcard certificate in a way that vpn.xyz.com uses the same certificate as www.xyz.com. So you can just extract these. And obviously, the best. Prob the, probably the best scenario is to, to just create your own user and join the network and own everyone with your exploit toolkit. But there is something else that you could do as well. You could attack the actual VPN clients. So suppose that the admin wants to connect, has some ticket opened at uh, 6 AM at Saturday night, at Saturday morning, and he needs to connect remotely. So he, has, he probably has a way to connect to the network and actually manage everything. What if the way that you, you actually connect is you request script, and you get prompted to install an ActiveX. The ActiveX is signed, though. But if the installation fails, it asks you to uh, execute the to install the following SSL, SSL VPN client. So anyone has any idea for a new client? I'm guessing most people would actually install it, but you're still a bit limited. I was actually the guy that drew the network diagram for me. I was telling him about this one, and he said there's no reason to do that because, as as an SSL VPN administrator, I can tell the SSL VPN to 
do whatever you want on your computer once you log in, like an update, like a log on scripts. So apparently you can do that. And when I tried it, it asked me, it told me the SSL VPN wants to run something on your computer. Will you allow it? And apparently it just happens because the SSL VPN wasn't on my trusted hosts. But I'm assuming that if I'm managing one, it should be on my trusted hosts. But I'm not sure. So a little bit about the actual vulnerability disclosure process. It was pretty amazing. I contacted F5. They responded within about four hours, I, th I, th I believe. And they told me, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please give us the technical details. We'll try to fix it as soon as possible. And they fixed it in about four days, which was, and they actually patched it in a way that it actually, that it's actually patched. And it didn't just patch that. I actually had a, another like six out of zero days as well, but they patched those as well. So it's, they did a pretty good job. And they also wanted me to state here that they want to work with all, with all researchers. So you can, contact them here if you'd like. So yeah, that's summary too much. Let's just do a demo. Okay, so while everything loads up, I'll tell you. By the way, they actually invited me at five to their private event and in Black Hat, and they were pretty awesome. They, we had they invited me to a dinner with a couple of other researchers and free booze and everything on F five. So it was pretty fun. <laughs> okay, so I think it should be available now. Nope, not yet. OK. So this is the actual login screen, the, the initial one that you, you're supposed to log in with. And here's the tunnel handler that you get errors from. So before I actually exploit it, just letting you know, there is no such script. I'm not, I'm not cheating. The final query. OK. So. Now let's see if we got it. <laughs> and we got command execution. <laughs> now apparently I'm not I'm not root, I'm Urom. And by the way, that that actually was pretty interesting because I kept seeing Urom. So apparently Urom is a company that used to uh, they actually developed an SSL VPN appliance. And as you can guess, it's this one. F5 bought them um, like, I don't know, six or seven years ago, maybe more, a, lo a long time ago. So just let's sudo. Who am I? So I'm root. So <laughs> it's good enough. <laughs> I don't care. And we can also get an actual reverse shell because they have Netcat available. So now I can actually work <laughs> work well with everything. So so yeah, it works. And ah, just a sec.
Yeah, and I also really, really, really want to thank the EFF. The thing was, I wanted to contact F, uh, F5, but I didn't know how they would respond. I didn't want them to start threatening me or suing me or anything like that. So I contacted the EFF, and they actually prox they acted like a proxy between me and F5. So only when they, they noticed that F5 were cool about it and everything, like the four hours that it took to, for the email, it was I emailed the EFF, and the EFF proxied it to them, and they proxied it back. So I, I really want to thank Marsha Hoffman and the EFF for their legal consulting and help. It was amazing. And a few other people, M Mati Aoni, a.k.a. Mats, from Backtrack, actually helped me configure a lot of stuff here and solve a lot of problems with the Linux uh, part. And Oana Vlam, a.k.a. Oana AV, Ninja, one of the best reversers I know, and actually pretty good with Linux as well, apparently. <laughs> and a couple of other people that helped me through this project and others. And any questions? So any questions? Do you know if the billion dollars company you mentioned at the beginning actually patched their VPNs? I'm sorry, I think. Did, did you, do you know if the billion dollars company you mentioned were running this uh, VPN did patch? Uh, I have no idea if they patched, to be <laughs> honest. I, I really hope they, they, they did, but if they didn't, I really hope they do now. But, and but uh, did you try some Google Foo and Google search to um, evaluate if, it, if it's really easy to touch appliances on the internet or if they are kind of hidden? Uh, did you ask if... Uh, if uh, there's a good, easy good way to search for them on, on yeah. the line. Well, yeah, there is, but uh, don't ask me for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Questions? No. All right. Well, Ty, I want to thank you for a great talk. Thanks.